Welcome to Exploration Dreamland, a quiet read aloud of the writings of explorers of the real world and the worlds of imagination. Drop anchor, relax into your comfortable bunk, and drift off to dreamland with us as we read Storm Over Warlock by Andre Norton. If you would like to stay in touch between episodes, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Exploration Dreamland. If you would like to recommend a text, please email us at Exploration Dreamland, all one word, at gmail.com. The first season of this podcast is dedicated to the memory of my friend, Ed Sears. He was a runner, coach, science enthusiast, and science fiction aficionado who was often gently encouraging of my crazy ideas. Now, take a deep breath in, and as you exhale, relax any tension in your muscles. Close your eyes. Snuggle into your sleeping space and listen to tonight's tale. Storm Over Warlock by Andre Norton, originally published in 1960. Chapter 1 Disaster The Throg Task Force struck the Terran survey camp a few minutes after dawn, without warning, and with a deadly precision which argued that the aliens had fully reconnoitered and prepared that attack. Eye-searing lances of energy lashed back and forth across the base with methodical accuracy, and a single cowering witness, flattened on a ledge in the heights above, knew that when the last of those yellow-red bolts fell, nothing human would be left alive down there. His teeth closed hard upon the thick stuff of the sleeve covering his thin forearm, and in his throat a scream of terror and rage was stillborn. More than caution kept him pinned on that narrow shelf of rock. Watching that holocaust below, Shan Lante could not force himself to move. The sheer ruthlessness of the throg move-in left him momentarily weak. To listen to a tale of throgs in action, and to be an eyewitness to such action, were two vastly different things. He shivered in spite of the warmth of the Survey Corps uniform. As yet, he had sighted none of the aliens, only their plate-shaped flyers. They would stay aloft until their long-range weapon cleared out all opposition. But how had they been able to make such a complete annihilation of the Terran force? The last report had placed the nearest throg nest at least two systems away from Warlock, and a patrol lane had been drawn about the Circe system the minute that Survey had marked its second planet ready for colonization. Somehow the beetles had slipped through that supposedly tight cordon and would now consolidate their gains with their usual speed at rooting. First an energy attack to finish the small Terran force, then they would simply take over. A month later, or maybe two months, and they could not have done it. The grids would have been up and any throg ship venturing into Warlock's amber-tinted sky would abruptly cease to be. In the race for survival as a galactic power, Terra had that one small edge over the swarms of the enemy. They need only stake out their new-found world and get the grids assembled on its surface, then that planet would be locked to the beetles. The critical period was between the first discovery of a suitable colony world and the erection of grid control. Planets in the past had been lost during that time lag, just as Warlock was lost now. Throgs and Terrans For more than a century now, planet time, they had been fighting their queer, twisted war among the stars. 
Terrans hunted worlds for colonization, the old hunger for land of their own driving men from the overpopulated worlds out of Sol's system to the far stars. And those worlds barren of intelligent native life, open to settlers, were none too many and widely scattered. Perhaps half a dozen were found in a quarter century, and of that six, maybe only one was suitable for human life without any costly and lengthy adaptation of man or world. Warlock was one of the lucky finds which came so seldom. Throgs were predators, living on the loot they garnered. As yet, mankind had not been able to discover whether they did indeed swarm from any home world. Perhaps they lived eternally on board their plate ships with no permanent base, forced into a wandering life by the destruction of the planet on which they had originally been spawned. But they were raiders now, laying waste defenseless worlds, picking up the wealth of shattered cities in which no native life remained. And their hidden temporary bases were looped about the galaxy their need for worlds with an atmosphere similar to Terra's as necessary as that of man. For in spite of their grotesque insectile bodies, their wholly alien minds, the throgs were warm-blooded, oxygen-breathing creatures. After the first few clashes, the early Terran explorers had endeavored to promote a truce between the species, only to discover that between Throg and man there appeared to be no meeting ground at all, total differences of mental processes producing insurmountable misunderstanding. There was simply no point of communication, so the Terrans had suffered one smarting defeat after another until they perfected the grid, and now their colonies were safe, at least when time worked in their favor. It had not on Warlock. A last vivid lash of red cracked over the huddle of domes in the valley. Shan blinked, half blinded by that glare. His jaws ached as he unclenched his teeth. That was the finish. Breathing raggedly, he raised his head, beginning to realize that he was the only one of his kind left alive on a none-too-hospitable world controlled by enemies without shelter or supplies. He edged back into the narrow cleft, which was the entrance to the ledge. As a representative of his species, he was not impressive, and now, with those shudders he could not master, shaking his thin body, he looked even smaller and more vulnerable. Shan drew his knees up close under his chin. The hood of his woodsman's jacket was pushed back in spite of the chill of the morning, and he wiped the back of his hand across his lips and chin in an oddly childish gesture. None of the men below who had been alive only minutes earlier had been close friends of his. Shan had never known anyone but acquaintances in his short, roving life. Most people had ignored him completely, except to give orders, and one or two had been actively malicious, like Garth Torvald. Shan grimaced at a certain recent memory, and then that grimace faded into wonder. If young Torvald hadn't purposefully tried to get Shan into trouble by opening the wolverine's cage, Shan wouldn't be here now, alive and safe for a time. He'd have been down there, with the others. The Wolverines For the first time since Shan had heard the crackle of the Throg attack, he remembered the reason he had been heading into the hills. Of all the men on the survey team, Shan Lante had been the least important. The dirty, tedious clean-up jobs the dull routines which required no technical training but which had to be performed to keep the camp functioning comfortably, those had been his portion. And he had accepted that status willingly 
just to have a chance to be included among survey personnel. Not that he had the slightest hope of climbing up to even an SE3 rating in the service. Part of those menial activities had been to clean the animal cages, and there Shan Lante had found something new, something so absorbing that most of the tiring dull labor had ceased to exist except as tasks to finish before he could return to the fascination of the animal runs. Survey teams had early discovered the advantage of using mutated and highly trained Terran animals as assistants in the exploration of strange worlds. From the biological laboratories and breeding farms on Terra came a trickle of specialized aide-de-camp to accompany man into space. Some were fighters, silent, more deadly than weapons a man wore at his belt or carried in his hands. Some were keener eyes, keener noses, keener scouts than the human kind could produce. Bred for intelligence, for size, for adaptability to alien conditions, the animal explorers from Terra were prized. Wolverines, the ancient devils of the Northlands on Terra, were being tried for the first time on Warlock. Their caution, a quality highly developed in their breed, made them testers for new territory. Able to tackle in battle an animal three times their size, they should be added protection for the man they accompanied into the wilderness, and their wide-ranging, their ability to climb and swim, and above all their curiosity, were assets. Shan had begun contact by cleaning their cages, he ended captivated by these miniature bears with long bushy tails, and to his unbounded delight the attraction was mutual. Alone to Taggy and Togi he was a person, an important person. Those teeth, which could tear flesh into ragged strips, nipped gently at his fingers, closed without any pressure on arm, even on nose and chin, in what was the ultimate caress of their kind. Since they were escape artists of no mean ability, twice he had had to track and lead them back to camp from forays of their own devising. But the second time he had been caught by Fadakar, the chief of animal control, before he could lock up the delinquents and the memory of the resulting interview still had the power to make him flush with impotent anger. Shan's explanation had been contemptuously brushed aside, and he had been delivered an ultimatum. If his carelessness occurred again, he would be sent back on the next supply ship to be dismissed without an official sign-off on his work record thus locked out of even the lowest level of survey for the rest of his life. That was why Garth Torvald's act of the night before had made Shan brave the unknown darkness of Warlock alone when he had discovered that the test animals were gone. He had to locate and return them before Fadakar made his morning inspection. Garth Torvald's attempt to get him into bad trouble had saved his life. Shan cowered back, striving to make his huddled body as small as possible. One of the throg flyers appeared silently out of the misty amber of the morning sky, hovering over the silent camp. The aliens were coming in to inspect the site of their victory, and the safest place for any Terran now was as far from the vicinity of those silent domes as he could get. Shan's slight body was an asset as he wedged through the narrow mouth of a cleft and so back into the cliff wall. The climb before him he knew in part, for this was the path the wolverines had followed on their two other escapes. A few moments of tricky scrambling and he was out in a cup-like depression, choked with brush, covered with the purplish foliage of Warlock. On the other side of that was a small cut to a sloping hillside, giving on another valley, not as wide as that in which the camp stood, 
but one well provided with cover in the way of trees and high-growing bushes. A light wind pushed among the trees, and twice Shan heard the harsh, rasping call of a clack-clack, one of the bat-like leather-winged flyers that laired in pits along the cliff walls. That present snap of two-tone complaint suggested that the land was empty of strangers, for the clack-clacks vociferously and loudly resented encroachment on their chosen hunting territory. Shan hesitated. He was driven by the urge to put as much distance between him and the landing throgship as he could, but to arouse the attention of inquisitive clack-clacks was asking for trouble. Perhaps it would be best to keep on along the top of the cliff, rather than risk a descent to take cover in the valley the flyers patrolled. A patch of dust, sheltered by a tooth-shaped projection of rock, gave the Terran his first proof that Taggy and his mate had preceded him, for printed firmly there was the familiar paw mark of a wolverine. Shan began to hope that both animals had taken to cover in the wilderness ahead. He licked dry lips. Having left secretly without any emergency pack, he had no canteen, and now Shan inventoried his scant possessions. A field kit, heavy-duty clothing, a short hooded jacket with attached mittens, the breast marked with the survey insignia. His belt supported a sheathed stunner and bush knife, and seam pockets held three credit tokens, a twist of wire intended to reinforce the latch of the wolverine cage, a packet of Bravo tablets, two identity and work cards, and a length of cord. No rations, save the Bravos, no extra charge for his stunner, but he did have, weighing down a loop on the jacket, a small atomic torch. The path he followed ended abruptly in a cliff drop, and Shan made a face at the odor rising from below, even though that scent meant he could climb down to the valley floor here without fearing any clack-clack attention. Chemical fumes from a mineral spring funneled against the wall, warding off any nesting in this section. Shan drew up the hood of his jacket and snapped the transparent face mask into place. He must get away, then find food, water, a hiding place. That will to live which had made Shan Lante fight innumerable battles in the past was in command, bracing him with a stubborn determination. The fumes swirled up in a smoke haze about his waist, but he strode on, heading for the open valley and cleaner air. That sickly lavender vegetation bordering the spring deepened in color to the normal purple-green, and then he was in a grove of trees, their branches pointed skyward at sharp angles to the rust-red trunks. A small skitterer burst from moss-spotted ground covering, giving an alarmed squeak, skimming out of sight as suddenly as it had appeared. Shan squeezed between two trees and then paused. The trunk of the larger was deeply scored with scratches dripping viscid gobs of sap, a sap which was a bright froth of scarlet. Taggy had left his mark here, and not too long ago. The soft carpet of moss showed no paw marks, but he thought he knew the goal of the animals, a lake down valley. Shan was beginning to plan now. The throgs had not blasted the Terran camp out of existence. They had only made sure of the death of its occupiers, which meant they must have some use for the installations, for the general loot of a survey field camp would be relatively worthless to those who picked over the treasure of entire cities elsewhere. Why? What did the throgs want? and would the alien invaders continue to occupy the domes for long? Shan did not realize what had happened to him since that shock of ruthless attack. From early childhood, when he had been thrown on his own to scratch a living, 
a borderline existence of a living. On the dumps of Tyre, he had had to use his wits to keep life in a scrawny and undersized body. However, since he had been eating regularly from survey rations, he was not quite so scrawny anymore. His formal education was close to zero, his informal and off-center schooling vast. And that particular toughening process which had been working on him for years now aided in his speedy adaptation to a new set of facts, formidable ones. He was alone on a strange and perhaps hostile world. Water, food, safe shelter, those were important now. And once again, away from the ordered round of the camp where he had been ruled by the desires and requirements of others, he was thinking, planning in freedom. Later, his hand went to the butt of his stunner. Perhaps later, he might just find a way of extracting an accounting from the beetle faces, too. For the present, he would have to keep away from the throgs, which meant well away from the camp. A fleck of green showed through the amethyst foliage before him. The lake. Shan wriggled through a last bush barrier and stood to look out over that surface. A sleek brown head bobbed up. Shan put fingers to his mouth and whistled. The head turned, black button eyes regarded him, short legs began to churn water. To his gratification, the swimmer was obeying his summons. Taggy came ashore, pausing on the fine gray sand of the verge to shake himself vigorously. Then the wolverine came upslope at a clumsy gallop to Shan. With an unknown feeling swelling inside him, the Terran went down on both knees, burying both hands in the coarse brown fur, warming to the uproarious welcome Taggy gave him. Togi? Shan asked as if the other could answer. He gazed back to the lake, but Taggy's mate was nowhere in sight. The blunt head under his hand swung around, black button nose pointed north. Shan had never been sure just how intelligent, as mankind measured intelligence, the wolverines were. He had come to suspect that Fatakar and the other experts had underrated them and that both beasts understood more than they were given credit for. Now he followed an experiment of his own, one he had had a chance to try only a few times before, and never at length. Pressing his palm flat on Taggy's head, Shan thought of throgs and of their attack, trying to arouse in the animal a corresponding reaction to his own horror and anger. And Taggy responded. A mutter became a growl. Teeth gleamed, those cruel teeth of a carnivore to whom they were weapons of aggression. Danger, Shan thought. Danger. Then he raised his hand, and the wolverine shuffled off, heading north. The man followed. They discovered Togi busy in a small cove where a jagged tangle of drift made a mat dating from the last high-water period. She was finishing a hearty breakfast, the remains of a water rat being buried thriftily against future need after the instincts of her kind. When she was done, she came to Shan, inquiry plain to read in her eyes. There was water here, and good hunting. But the sight was too close to the throgs. Let one of their exploring flyers sight them and the little group was finished. Better cover. That's what the three fugitives must have. Shan scowled, not at Togi, but at the landscape. He was tired and hungry, but he must keep on going. A stream fed into the cove from the west, a guide of sorts. With very little knowledge of the countryside, Shan was inclined to follow that. Overhead, the sun made its usual golden haze of the sky. A flight of vivid green streaks marked a flock of lake ducks coming for a morning feeding. Lake duck was good eating, but Shan had no time to hunt one now. 
Togi started down the bank of the stream, Taggy behind her. Either they had caught his choice subtly through some undefined mental contact, or they had already picked that road on their own. Shan's attention was caught by a piece of the drift. He twisted the length free and had his first weapon of his own manufacture, a club. Using it to hold back a low sweeping branch, he followed the wolverines. Within the half hour, he had breakfast too. A pair of limp skitterers, their long hind feet lashed together with a thong of grass, hung from his belt. They were not particularly good eating, but they were meat and acceptable. The three, man and wolverines, made their way up the stream to the valley wall and through a feeder ravine into the larger space beyond. There, where the stream was born at the foot of a falls, they made their first camp. Judging that the morning haze would veil any smoke, Shan built a pocket-sized fire. He seared, rather than roasted, the skitterers after he made an awkward and messy business of skinning them, and tore the meat from the delicate bones in greedy mouthfuls. The wolverines lay side by side on the gravel, now and again raising a head alertly to test the scent on the air or gaze into the distance. Taggy made a warning sound deep in the throat. Shan tossed handfuls of sand over the dying fire. He had only time to fling himself face down, hoping the drab and weathered cloth of his uniform faded into the color of the earth on which he lay, every muscle tense. A shadow swung across the hillside. Shan's shoulders hunched, and he cowered again. That terror he had known on the ledge was back in full force, as he waited for the beam to lick at him as it had earlier at his fellows. The throgs were on the hunt. Chapter 2 Death of a Ship That sigh of displaced air was not as loud as a breeze, but it echoed monstrously in Shan's ears. He could not believe in his luck as that sound grew fainter drew away into the valley he had just left. With infinite caution, he raised his head from his arm, still hardly able to accept the fact that he had not been sighted, that the throgs and their flyer were gone. But that black plate was spinning out into the sun haze. One of the beetles might have suspected that there were Terran fugitives and ordered a routine patrol. After all, how could the aliens know that they had caught all but one of the survey party in camp? Though with all the Terran scout flitters grounded on the field, the men dead in their bunks, the surprise would seem to be complete. As Shan moved, Taggy and Togi came to life also. They had gone to earth with speed, and the man was sure that both beasts had sensed danger. Not for the first time he knew a burning desire for the formal education he had never had. In camp he had listened, dragging out routine jobs in order to overhear reports and the small talk of specialists keen on their own particular hobbies. But so much of the information Shan had thus picked up to store in a retentive memory he had not understood and could not fit together. It had been as if he were trying to solve some highly important puzzle with at least a quarter of the necessary pieces missing, or with unrelated bits from others intermixed. How much control did a trained animal scout have over his furred or feathered assistants? and was part of that mastery a mental rapport built up between man and animal. How well would the wolverines obey him now, especially when they would not return to camp where cages stood waiting as symbols of human authority? Wouldn't a trek into the wilderness bring about a revolt for complete freedom? If Shan could depend upon the animals, it would mean a great deal 
Not only would their superior hunting ability provide all three with food, but their scouting senses, so much keener than his, might erect a slender wall between life and death. Few large native beasts had been discovered on Warlock by the Terran explorers, and of those four or five different species, none had proved hostile if unprovoked. But that did not mean that somewhere back in the wild lands into which Shan was heading, there were no heretofore unknowns, perhaps slyer and as vicious as the wolverines when they were aroused to rage. Then there were the dreams, which had afforded a prime source of camp discussion and dispute. Shan brushed coarse sand from his boots and thought about the dreams. Did they or did they not exist? You could start an argument any time by making a definite statement for or against the peculiar sort of dreaming reported by the first scout to set ship on this world. The Circe system, of which Warlock was the second of three planets, had first been scouted four years ago by one of those explorers traveling solo in survey service. Everyone knew that the first Inn Scouts were a weird breed, almost a mutation of Terran stock. Their reports were rife with strange observations. So an alarming one concerning Circe, a yellow sun such as Sol, and her three planets, was not so rare. Which, the world nearest in orbit to Circe, was too hot for human occupancy without drastic and too costly world-changing. Wizard, the third out from the sun, was mostly bare rock and highly poisonous water. But Warlock, swinging through space between two forbidding neighbors, seemed to be just what the settlement board ordered. Then the survey scout, even in the cocoon safety of his well-armed ship, began to dream and from those dreams a horror of the apparently empty world developed until he fled the planet to preserve his sanity. There had been a second visit to Warlock in check. Worlds so well adapted to human emigration could not be lightly thrown away. And this time there was a negative report, no trace of dreams, no registration of any outside influence on the delicate and complicated equipment the ship carried. So the survey team had been dispatched to prepare for the coming of the first pioneers, and none of them had dreamed either, at least no more than the ordinary dreams all men accepted. Only there were those who pointed out that the seasons had changed between the first and second visits to Warlock. That first scout had planeted in summer. His successors had come in fall and winter. They argued that the final release of the world for settlement should not be given until the full year on Warlock had been sampled. But the pressure of emigrant control had forced their hands, that and the fear of just what had eventually happened, an attack from the throgs, so they had speeded up the process of declaring Warlock open. Only Ragnar Torvald had protested that decision up to the last and had gone back to headquarters on the supply ship a month ago to make a last appeal for a more careful study. Shan stopped brushing the sand from the tough fabric above his knee. Ragnar Torvald. He remembered back to the port landing apron on another world, remembered with a sense of loss he could not define. That had been about the second biggest day of his short life. The biggest had come earlier when they had actually allowed him to sign on for survey duty. He had tumbled off the cross-continent cargo carrier, his kit, a very meager kit, slung over his thin shoulder a hot eagerness expanding inside him until he thought that he could not continue to throttle down that wild happiness. There was a waiting starship, 
and he, Shan Lante from the dumps of Tyre, without any influence or schooling, was going to blast off in her, wearing the brown-green uniform of survey. Then he had hesitated uncertainly, had not quite dared cross the few feet of apron lying between him and that compact group wearing the same uniform, with a slight difference, that of service bars and completion badges and rank insignia, with the unconscious self-assurance of men who had done this many times before. But after a moment, that whole group had become, in his own shy appraisal, just a background for one man. Shan had never before known, in his pinched and limited childhood, his lost boyhood, any one who aroused in him hero worship, and he could not have put a name to the new emotion that added so suddenly to his burning desire to make good not only to hold the small niche in survey which he had already so painfully achieved, but to climb, until he could stand so in such a group talking easily to that tall man, his uncovered head bronze-yellow in the sunlight, his cool gray eyes pale in his brown face. Not that any of those wild dreams born in that minute or two had been realized in the ensuing months, Probably those dreams had always been as wild as the ones reported by the first scout on Warlock. Shan grinned wryly now at the short period of childish hope and half-confidence that he could do big things. Only one Torvald had ever noticed Shan's existence in the survey camp, and that had been Garth. Garth Torvald, a far less impressive, one could say, smudged copy of his brother. Swaggering with an arrogance Ragnar never showed, Garth was a cadet on his first mission, intent upon making Shan realize the unbridgeable gulf between a labor hand and an officer to be. He had appeared to know right from their first meeting just how to make Shan's life a misery. Now, in this slit of valley well away from the domes, Shan's fists balled. He pounded them against the earth in a way he had so often hoped to plant them on Garth's smoothly handsome face, his well-muscled body. One didn't survive the dumps of tire without learning how to use fists and boots and a list of tricks they didn't teach in any academy. He had always been sure that he could take Garth if they mixed it up, but if he had loosed the tight rein he had kept on his temper and offered that challenge, he would have lost his chance with survey. Garth had proved himself able to talk his way out of any scrape, even minor derelictions of duty, and he far outranked Shan. The laborer from Tyre had had to swallow all that the other could dish out and hope that on his next assignment he would not be a member of young Torvald's team. Though, because of Garth Torvald, Shan's toll of black record marks had mounted dangerously high and each day the chance for any more duty tours had grown dimmer. Shan laughed and the sound was ugly. That was one thing he didn't have to worry about any longer. There would be no other assignments for him. The throgs had seen to that. And Garth, well, there would never be a showdown between them now. He stood up. The throg ship had disappeared. They could push on. He found a break in the cliff wall which was climbable, and he coaxed the wolverines after him. When they stood on the heights from which the falls tumbled, Taggy and Togi rubbed against him, cried for his attention. They, too, appeared to need the reassurance they got from contact with him, for they were also fugitives on this alien world, the only representatives of their kind. Since he did not have any definite goal in view, Shan continued to be guided by the stream, 
following its wanderings across a plateau. The sun was warm, so he carried his jacket slung across one shoulder. Taggy and Togi ranged ahead, twice catching skitterers, which they devoured voraciously. A shadow on a sun-baked rock sent the Terran skidding for cover until he saw that it was cast by one of the questing falcons from the upper peaks. But that shook his confidence, so he again sought cover, ashamed at his own carelessness. In the late afternoon he reached the far end of the plateau, faced a climb to peaks which still bore cones of snow, now tinted a soft peach by the sun. Shan studied that possible path and distrusted his own powers to take it without proper equipment or supplies. He must turn either north or south, though he would then have to abandon a sure water supply in the stream. Tonight he would camp where he was. He had not realized how tired he was until he found a likely half-cave in the mountain wall and crawled in. There was too much danger in fire here. He would have to do without that first comfort of his kind. Luckily, the wolverines squeezed in beside him to fill the hole. With their warm furred bodies sandwiching him, Shan dozed, awoke, and dozed again, listening to night sounds, the screams, cries, hunting calls of the warlock wilds. Now and again one of the wolverines whined and moved uneasily. Fingers of sun picked at Shan through a shaft among the rocks, striking his eyes. He moved, blinked blearily awake, unable for the first few seconds to understand why the smooth plasta wall of his bunk had become rough red stone. Then he remembered. He was alone, and he threw himself frantically out of the cave, afraid the wolverines had wandered off. Only both animals were busy clawing under a boulder with a steady persistence which argued there was a purpose behind that effort. A sharp sting on the back of one hand made that purpose only too clear to Shan, and he retreated hurriedly from the vicinity of the excavation. They had found an earth wasp's burrow and were hunting grubs, naturally arousing the rightful inhabitants to bitter resentment. Shan faced the problem of his own breakfast. He had had the immunity shots given to all members of the team and he had eaten game brought in by exploring parties and labeled safe, but how long he could keep to the varieties of native food he knew was uncertain. Sooner or later he must experiment for himself. Already he drank the stream water without the aid of purifiers, and so far there had been no ill results from that necessary recklessness. Now the stream suggested fish, but instead he chanced upon another water inhabitant which had crawled up on land for some obscure purpose of its own. It was a sluggish, scaled thing, an easy victim to his club. With thin, weak legs it could project at will from a finned and armor-plated body. Shan offered the head and guts to Togi, who had abandoned the wasp nest, she sniffed in careful investigation and then gulped. Shan built a small fire and seared the firm greenish flesh. The taste was flat, lacking salt, but the food eased his emptiness. Enheartened, he started south, hoping to find water sometime during the morning. By noon, he had his optimism justified with the discovery of a spring and the wolverines had brought down a slender-legged animal whose coat was close in shade to the dusky purple of the vegetation. Smaller than a Terran deer, its head bore not horns, but a ridge of stiffened hair rising in a point some twelve inches above the skull dome. 
Shan haggled off some ragged steaks while the wolverines feasted in earnest, carefully burying the head afterward. It was when Shan knelt by the spring pool to wash that he caught the clamor of the clack-clacks. He had seen or heard nothing of the flyers since he had left the lake valley. But from the noise now rising in an ear-splitting volume, he thought there was a sizable colony nearby and that the inhabitants were thoroughly aroused. He crept on his hands and knees to nearby brush cover, heading toward the source of that outburst. If the clacks were announcing a throg scouting party, he wanted to know it. Lying flat, with branches forming a screen over him, the Terran gazed out on a stretch of grassland which sloped at a fairly steep angle to the south and which must lead to a portion of countryside well below the level he was now traversing. The clack-clacks were skimming back and forth, shrieking their staccato war cries. Following the erratic dashes of their flight formation, Shan decided that whatever they railed against was on the lower level, out of his sight from that point. Should he simply withdraw, since the disturbance was not near him? Prudence dictated that, yet still he hesitated. He had no desire to travel north or to try and scale the mountains. No, south was his best path, and he should be very sure that the route was closed before he retreated. Since any additional fuss the clack-clacks might make on sighting him would be undistinguished in their now general clamor, the Terran crawled on to where tall grass provided a screen at the top of the slope. There he stopped short, his hands digging into the earth in sudden breaking action. Below, the ground steamed from a rocket flareback, grasses burned away from the fins of a small scout ship. But even as Shan rose to one knee, his shout of welcome choked in his throat. One of those fins sank, canting the ship crookedly, preventing any new takeoff. And over the crown of a low hill to the west swung the ominous black plate of a throg flyer. The throg ship came up in a burst of speed, and Shan waited tensely for some counter move from the scout. Those small, speedy Terran ships were prudently provided with weapons triply deadly in proportion to their size. He was sure that the Terran ship could hold its own against the throg, even eliminate the enemy. But there was no fire from the slanting pencil of the scout. The throg circled warily, obviously expecting a trap. Twice it darted back in the direction from which it had come. As it returned from its second retreat, another of its kind showed, a black coin dot against the amber of the sky. Shan felt sick inside. Now the Terran scout had lost any advantage and perhaps all hope. The throgs could box the other in, cut the downed ship to pieces with their energy beams. He wanted to crawl away and not witness this last disaster for his kind, but some stubborn core of will kept him where he was. The throgs began to circle while beneath them the flock of clack-clacks screamed and dived at the slanting nose of the Terran ship. Then that same slashing energy he had watched quarter the camp snapped from the far plate across the stricken scout. The man who had piloted her, if not dead already, which might account for the lack of defense, must have fallen victim to that. But the throg was going to make very sure. The second flyer halted, remaining poised long enough to unleash a second bolt, dazzling any watching eyes and broadcasting a vibration to make Shan's skin crawl when the last faint ripple reached his lookout post. 
What happened then, the overconfident Throg was not prepared to take. Shan cried out, burying his face on his arm, as pinwheels of scarlet light blotted out normal sight. There was an explosion, a deafening blast. He cowered, blind, unable to hear. Then, rubbing at his eyes, he tried to see what had happened. Through watery blurs he made out the throg ship, not swinging now in serene indifference to warlock's gravity, but whirling end over end across the sky as might a leaf tossed in a gust of wind. Its rim caught against a rust-red cliff, it rebounded and crumpled. Then it came down, smashing perhaps half a mile away from the smoking crater in which lay the mangled wreckage of the Terran ship. The disabled scout pilot must have played a last desperate game, making of his ship bait for a trap. The Terran had taken one throg with him. Shan rubbed again at his eyes, just barely able to catch a glimpse of the second ship flashing away westward. Perhaps it was only his impaired sight, but it appeared to him that the throg followed an erratic path, either as if the pilot feared to be caught by a second shot, or because that ship had also suffered some injury. Acid smoke wreathed up from the valley, making Shan wretch and cough. There could be no survivor from the Terran scout, and he did not believe that any throg had lived to crawl free of the crumpled plate. But there would be other beetles swarming here soon. They would not dare to leave the scene unsearched. He wondered about that scout. Had the pilot been aiming for the survey camp? the absence of any rider beam from there warning him off so that he made the detour which brought him here? Or had the throgs tried to blast the Terran ship in the upper atmosphere, crippling it, making this a forced landing? But at least this battle had cost the throgs, settling a small portion of the Terran debt for the lost camp. The length of time between Shan's sighting of the grounded ship and the attack by the throgs had been so short that he had not really developed any strong hope of rescue to be destroyed by the end of the crippled ship. On the other hand, seeing the throgs taking a beating had exploded his subconscious acceptance of their superiority. He might not have even the resources of a damaged scout at his command, but he did have Taggy, Togi, and his own brain. Since he was fated to permanent exile on Warlock, there might just be some way to make the Beatles pay for that. He licked his lips. Real action against the aliens would take a lot of planning. Shan would have to know more about what made a throg a throg, more than all the wild stories he had heard over the years. There had to be some way a Terran could move effectively against a beetlehead. And he had a lot of time, maybe the rest of his life, to work out a few answers. That throg ship lying wrecked at the foot of the cliff Perhaps he could do a little investigating before any rescue squad arrived. Shan decided such a move was worth the try and whistled to the wolverines. Stay tuned for the next segment from Storm Over Warlock by Andre Norton. Please follow, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. Keep in touch with us on Twitter and Instagram, and recommend us to anyone you know who could use a quiet break or a little help falling asleep. Exploration Dreamland is produced, edited, and hosted by me, Sarah Van Zaley. 
A big thank you to Project Gutenberg for helping me find this and many other interesting publications. Thanks also to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for providing the theme music for this show. The title of this piece is Kalimba Relaxation Music, if you would like to visit his website to hear it in its entirety. Sweet dreams. <laughs>